I think AA and Al-Anon is a great life raft. I, I always give them that credit when I'm doing individual therapy is if you come in here and you have a problem in your relationship, particularly your marriage, and you feel great when you leave, I have done you a disservice. I should give you direction and insight and support and all of that. But if you're feeling as if everything is resolved when you have left my office, I have taken away that opportunity for you and your partner to actually engage. And I think that is one of the biggest issues with AA, NA, al and all of these other groups is that you go and get all of the resolution within it. And it creates this barrier between partners that they can't really argue about. Hi, Travis. Thank you so much for agreeing to talk to me about your book and your work and your experience in the world of addiction and family recovery. So if you can just introduce yourself, tell people a little bit about your life, your history, what brings you here and what drew you to write the book that we'll be talking about to those left behind and, and anything else you think is uh, important information. Well, yeah, my name's Travis Thompson. I'm a therapist, a mental health therapist in Murfreesboro, Tennessee. It's just south of Nashville. Um, I've worked uh, in facilities, both specifically with drug and alcohol abuse and also severe mental health uh, facilities. Um, I've started programs related to that, specifically around families and long-term recovery. Um, I now am in private practice and I'm hoping to finish my PhD next year in marriage and family therapy with a focus on addiction and relapse and recovery. Um, and so most of my practice is around addiction and recovery for couples, or even if I just see somebody individual, how they exist in their family system. It's not always the case, but often the case that people that end up in these positions have some sort of connection to the content that they're studying, teaching, working with. Do you like, do you have much personal connection to this kind of stuff? And if so, what is that? Sure. Yeah. For me, it was um, early on, um, I would say like 15, 16 years old. I was, the term that I use is a sprinter. So I, it didn't like build up over 10 years. Um, and I think that's partially due to my place in the family system and a whole bunch of other things. But um, that was me, uh, 15, starting like 15, 16, um, then around uh, beginning of 17, um, I spent some time not so voluntarily <laughs> in a mental health facility because of all of it. Um, and so that was for me, the beginning of really realizing a lot of it. And of course, just like anybody, um, if you're paying attention enough, you see it around you either in, you know, extended family or close friends and things like that. So after I started paying attention more, I started noticing it. And even especially as an adult, I've started to notice it as well. Yeah. And I guess, did, did you just sort of make the decision or how did you get into the counseling world? And I'm curious, kind of as a somewhat aspiring academic, and you do talk about this in the book, how you blend what we know academically you are through research and et cetera, with real life experience and real blending it into people's problems, that kind of thing. I guess after you had your experience when you were younger, were you drawn to work in this field, I guess, or like, what were you, what, not everybody says, I'm going to, you know, become a therapist and help people like, or whatever. Yeah. So for me, when I was younger, I started to realize that I had an ability to kind of read people or their situation. Um, at first, it was just a curiosity. I just thought it was kind of fun to be able to go, oh, so this is why you're anxious and frustrated. And people got real uncomfortable <laughs> with it. And so I kind of backed <laughs> off of saying it as often. Um, but I, I had just kind of this innate skill to be able to engage people that way. Um, as I got older, uh, I started to realize the value of it more. And when I got into college, I started to realize that the way that I was thinking about psychology and mental health was not exactly what I was being taught. Now, I'm not 
out of some complete left field, but I started to realize that there were things that I could actually contribute. And I, I went to grad school and there they do community mental health. Like you just take in clients for like $10 a session. Right. And, uh, I started to realize that if I just worked with, you know, basic anxiety, basic depression, like here are the skills you're here for five sessions, I would not make it. So I started tending towards the more severe and significant cases and found a love for it. So I kind of rediscovered that part of myself to engage with. And I found that I was much more engaged, much more excited, I was thinking innovation and all of those things when it came to those severe cases. Yeah. Wow. That's maybe that's a good segue into part of the book. It's my mind wants to ask you five questions at once. Maybe, yeah, just starting with, I don't, I don't know the difference. I mean, I have some intuition or understanding of the difference between the U.S. and the Canadian healthcare system and, and that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Even here, each province is different in terms of the healthcare delivery, but mm -hmm. we have some basic universal access to sort of detox recovery, uh, sort of detox and like treatment facilities but it's pretty haphazard, et cetera, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Maybe, I don't know if you can weave this into what you, in your book, sort of you outline really nicely sort of the differences, the difference in approach. So I think you have like the medical model, the moral, mm -hmm. behavioral, I think. Mm -hmm. And was there a fourth one? Neurological and attachment. Okay, that, that was one. Okay, and okay. So I, I guess you describe and, and one of the biggest a criticism of the modern mental health care delivery service model is mm -hmm. cramming people through you know a cbt like a cognitive behavioral mm -hmm. short-term treatment process or whatever or you know a solution focused kind of thing and those things tend not to be enough I think might be the right word for people that are really struggling with a variety of, of things. Mm -hmm. So like you described that sort of depression, anxiety, here's some skills and all those things are useful to help people treat the symptoms. And I like you point mm -hmm. out, I'm jumping around too much, but can you maybe just okay. point to that? Like uh, those sort of different categories of how we describe addiction and the limitations of kind of our surface level treatments towards it. The different models that I outline typically have followed a history, and I go into an explanation of how they came about. But the very beginning was this moral model, which was, don't do it, you dumb idiot. <laughs> um, and, you know, for some strange reason, shame didn't work. Yeah. Complete shocker. Uh, um, uh, then, then we kind of got into this more medical-ish area and that has persisted to this day. And that's where you see a lot of these behavioral therapies come from, which is addressing symptomology. Um, and one of the things that I used to tell, um, you know, men and women in, in inpatient facilities is if you were just looking for skills and information, I could have given you a pamphlet and sent you home. If that's all it took and that's all this is, is to get some good info. I, I mean, I'll even, I'll sell you a book now. Um, but yeah. back then it was just, well, I'll just give you this info. Um, and, and the reason that, well, I think there's a few reasons why this has developed the way that it has. Um, number one, it's easily uh, identifiable and it's easy to track. So you can see reduction in symptoms. Um, one of the big criticisms that I have is, well, you're obviously going to see a reduction in symptoms when they're removed from their everyday life and responsibilities. I don't think that I don't think that's special to your specific treatment. Um, and you also see how, to put it quite frankly, in the U.S., it's easy to charge insurance for it because it's been so repeatedly studied. Um, it's shown to be "quote unquote" the most effective thing. Um, it may or may not be, but I do know that. There have been so many repeated studies of it. Of course, it's going to look like the most effective because we're sharpening a knife over and over and over instead of just looking for other tools to see how it works. And so that tends to be what the American system does is it's let me give you this behavioral therapy, make sure you're OK, and then you leave. Here's some aftercare. Good luck with it. 
Yeah. And so, and actually, yeah, you, you point that out in the book really nicely when people go back into the family systems that mm -hmm. they came from and they're, they're re, I guess, re immersed in all the things that contributed to them getting to where they got, I guess, mm -hmm. um, something like that. Maybe, maybe can you just expand a bit more on the, cause certainly it's the case here the medicalization of addiction. So I used to be a part of this program at the Center for Addiction and Mental Health in Toronto, mm -hmm. which is the biggest mental health hospital in Canada. It's a very medicalized model mm -hmm. of, of treatment. And I do my best to try to be understanding. We have limitations, our governments don't mm -hmm. have money, all the kind of things that contribute to this, let's pump them through the system and send them out the door kind of sure. idea just to speak to like the complicated nature of trying to help people in these situations. And sure. yeah, if, if there could be, I don't know, sort of that idea of like, we can only go from where we are now, like how do you see maybe the sort of institutionalization treatment models improving or mm -hmm. not uh, contributing to this sort of revolving door? One of the biggest ways that we can help addiction long-term is shoring up and um, embracing a healthy family system. Um, because we actually have known for a very long time that you can bring someone into treatment and you can quote unquote, get them well, and you send them home and they go right back. We've known this in the U S since the fifties where we used to do it. And I talked about this in the book, the Philadelphia child guidance center. Yeah, um, yeah, we've yeah. known this for a long time that, you can get kids right or you can get people right. You send them home and it's pretty quick. You can even see this with like medication compliance, right? You get them into facilities. They take it every day. You send them home within a week. It's over, right? Um, I would say that when it comes to the institutionalization of it, the biggest argument that I put forth against this whole medical disease model, right, is pretty short and simple. It's, I've never heard of a disease that you could talk your way out of. Right. And so when people say, well, it's this medical disease, it's this treatment, you know, it's like type one diabetes, it's like cancer. It's like, well, you know, people can get therapy and then all of a sudden not drink again. So I'm not quite sure how that fits a medical model when therapy and relationships heal it. It seems to be, you know, the square peg in a round hole sort of thing. And I understand why. Because, you know, you have the guy with a broken leg right next to the alcoholic in the ER, and you can't blame the doctors for that. <laughs> they, they've got to treat as many people as they can as effectively as they can. And so it's kind of been co-opted into an area that it doesn't quite fit. Mm. Yeah, that's great. I, when I do psychoeducation stuff, I show this really funny video uh, that was made to sort of mock the difference in how we treat the physical ailments versus the whatever mental health ones. Mm -hmm. And and you also talked in the book. So if we say, and maybe with this can blend into, I'd love to hear your thoughts on AA, Al-Anon and that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Those were certainly huge parts of my journey mm -hmm. uh, and my wife's. So yeah, so the if it is a disease or whatever, then you say, okay, just treat the symptoms and that feeds the the beast of the pharmaceutical industry in some sense of like, well, let's just keep pumping these people with these medications sure. to fix them, whatever. Yeah. And, and maybe also how you understand, because in AA, right, alcoholism is a family disease is mm -hmm. what is, is said, right? And, and they don't mean disease the same way the medical model says disease, which, which I find interesting. Yeah. It depends on the area you're in because okay. sometimes they do. Sometimes like they very much AA. do. Yeah. Yeah. There are some, yeah. there are some that actually do will, will be a hundred percent on board that it's a disease, how you treat it. They'll see it differently. Um, right. Okay. Right. The big issue in AA, Al-Anon, NA, all those other things with the family system is they acknowledge it as a family issue. Right but then separate everybody and tell everybody individually it's a family issue. Okay, so again, we've also known from things like marriage research that if a couple is gonna get, is thinking about divorce, 
and you e give them each separate individual therapy, they're more likely to get divorced than if you did no therapy at all. So that's one of the big issues is it, you know, places like AA and Al-Anon, they're amazing and they're a godsend for so many people, but you can't say it's a family issue and then separate people and hope that that solves the family issue. Right. Yeah. You mentioned something like that in the book very uh, clearly uh, about how, yeah, when people have separate counseling, they end up divorced. I guess, do you, what do we do about that, I guess, in some sense? Because mm -hmm. I think one reason I'd love to understand your thoughts on this as a clinician, um, when I'm working with people who are struggling with substance use, mm -hmm. I'm, I, and I'm very clear and say, like, I'm biased towards these step models because there's not much else out there that you can mm -hmm. access 24 seven for free, et cetera. It does work. You know, mm -hmm. Clearly it works. I get why people are hesitant to do the 12 step stuff or whatever, but yeah, what do we, I guess, do about that? And I guess to your point to, or my wife and I, I guess when I entered recovery or whatever, I did have, I had a psychiatrist, a psychotherapist. Mm -hmm. I had a, a, I had Al Anon, even because I have a brother who lives with schizophrenia, which mm -hmm. I want to ask you about too. Sure. That in the book. You also write about this in the book very nicely. Like when one person is sort of recovering, so to speak, the mm -hmm. other person is left kind of having to mm -hmm. bear the burden of all kinds of shit. I'm asking about five questions at once, but so. <laughs> The, the original question was like, what do we do about these sort of pull? Like, how do we mm -hmm. help people? Um, and my wife and I, my wife eventually, after I was changing and being more responsible and kind of changing, I guess, she came to her own decision to go to Al Anon and to get help as well. Mm -hmm. And we also had marriage therapy. So, sure. yeah. So I guess, can you maybe? try to make sense of that jumbled thought stream and, and make it somewhat coherent. <laughs> sure. Yeah. When, it, when I do work with people and I work with couples, I don't ever advise against it wholeheartedly. Right. I think AA and Al-Anon is a great life raft in the middle of it. Cause I think the quote in the book is, I don't know of anybody else that will pick you up at 3 AM on a Tuesday behind a dumpster for free. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. Okay. So you know, I, I always give them that credit. They're an amazing life raft for so many people. Um, what I have seen as a therapist, particularly with couples, is it starts to create a rift between them because the energy is lost between the couple. It's one of the things that I focus on when I'm doing individual therapy is if you come in here and you have a problem in your relationship, particularly your marriage and you feel great when you leave, I have done you a disservice because then you're not going to go work on it with them. I, I should give you direction and insight and support and all of that. But if you're feeling as if everything is resolved when you have left my office, I have taken away that opportunity for you and your partner to actually engage. And I think that is one of the biggest issues with AA, NA, al and all of these other groups is that you go and get all of the resolution within it. And it creates this barrier between partners that they can't really argue about because I'm sure that they've said they've pleaded or prayed or whatever it was saying, if you would just get sober, it would be better. Well, then they got what they wanted and they realized it wasn't enough, but now they can't argue with it because that's what they wanted for so long. And so you sit with this barrier between two people that nobody wants to touch because they feel like everything's going to fall apart, but they also can't argue with because it's what they begged for. Right. And so people will sit in this limbo indefinitely and not really be all that happy. Um, and they'll feel like they can't do anything about it as well. And so that's kind of where I fall on it is short term. Yeah, it keeps people alive. Um, long term, it has a very high tendency to keep you emotionally distant from your partner. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's it's very insightful. The It's very succinct that idea that um you hoped and prayed the person would get sober then they did you got what mm -hmm. you asked for but ultimately in some ways it relates to the idea of um drugs are not the problem they're the solution right 
and you remove sure. the solution. The problem's still there, right? Yes. And the addict <laughs> is recovering and, and enjoying that. And, and of course, the partner or the family is left with their own stuff, I guess. So what would you say to the partner or spouse looking for help here, right? So for the the person that, you know, the addict, the alcoholic, whatever it is, enters recovery, starts getting well, they're having their own resolution to their own problems, whatever. But the spouse, the family system around them, I, I think we can assume wants to heal, mm -hmm. but also has all their own resentments and frustrations and issues with what has gone on. And how sure. do we help? Yeah, how do we help those people move forward? So this starts very <laughs> harsh, but ends well, okay? <laughs> yeah. I have had so many people come in and say, I cannot stand his drinking. I can't stand her use. And my next question is, how long have they been doing it? And they say, oh, seven years. Okay, you can't hate something for seven years and not get anything out of it. Tangible or intangible, there is something you're getting. And I talk about this in the book, how um, codependent relationships form and how they function, where partners and families, if they stay involved with it past like a, a breaking point, they're still receiving something, whether it's hope for the future or trying to resolve their own issues, whether it's deflecting their own things onto the partner, like, you know, maybe... Maybe I'm not good with money and I've got racked up credit card debt, but look at my husband over there. See, look at how bad he is. That's the more extreme version. Um, but the inner, you know, some of the hidden things are maybe I don't feel worthy in myself, but I feel worthy in being a helper. And so I will continue this and I will not lower my anxiety and feel it resolved because if I do that, then I lose a part of myself. So when I'm talking with couples and families, you obviously have to deal with your own stuff, but part of that is recognizing that you're playing a role here if you're involved, okay? You, you're doing something, and the way to find that healing is for everybody involved to make a resolution that they're getting healthy with boundaries, support, you know, their own interactions, and inviting the addict along with them. But there's a caveat. You cannot demand they come with you and you have to get healthy even when they don't. And so I, I outline this in the book, particularly with, I think it's in the couples chapter where you, you can say something like, I'm doing this, I'm getting healthy, no matter what happens, I'm inviting you to come along with me. And I have seen that work so much, so much more effectively than anything else, threats of divorce, threats of any of these things. That for me in my own practice has been absolutely astounding. Yeah, you have a great, I actually copied and pasted, the, you, you have a nice template for the letter mm -hmm. or, or like a framework for how you could communicate this to a loved one. Um, mm -hmm. So you give a framework for someone. So maybe just to kind of introduce this idea, if you are somebody who needs to have or wants to have a conversation like this with somebody you're caring for. Yeah, you know, on page 158 of Travis' book, there's a great uh, way to do that. I'm just going to read it. So I acknowledge and take responsibility for my role in your addiction. I have made years of compromises in my soul and the health of our relationship. I did not leave when I said I would or follow through on what I said was required. For that, I allowed our relationship to fall apart. However, I do not take responsibility for your addiction or how it has impacted us. I do not apologize for your addiction, but I do apologize for creating an environment where your addiction was tolerated and grown. I am taking a journey towards health. I am inviting you to join me on this journey. If you do not, I will go without you and find a better version of myself. I request that you do what I have asked of you for your health and our relationship. I hope one day we can find a new life together that is better than we ever had. That's pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'd hope so, considering I wrote it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I want to maybe speak to a little bit of, it's like a flip side of this, but it totally applies, mm -hmm. I think. And just to for more sort of disclosure purposes. So I guess I, my drug of choice was weed. And the, the crazy part about that is like, I knew it wouldn't kill me. 
So I just mm-hmm. decided at 15 years old that the other drugs I was doing would kill me. So why not do this? Um, you know, that's a good sign of a, of an addict to be. Um, <laughs> so when I got sober, uh, mm-hmm. or whatever, entered recovery, I remember as I was changing and becoming this new person, mm-hmm. my sponsor always said to me, you signed a marriage contract with your wife. Mm-hmm. She signed it, agreed to it. Now you've rewritten the terms of the agreement and you're mm. expecting her to agree to them. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And that obviously wasn't fair. And so I had to sort of swallow that pill continuously for a while. But at some point, right, and this can go both ways, I think. So whether Mm -hmm. it's the partner or the person in recovery, at some point, as you outline nicely here, I will go without you and find a better version of myself, whether or not you come with me. So Mm -hmm. how do you kind of help couples navigate that? And I guess it's different for every couple, but at some point, right, one person either decides to come along or does not. Sure. And yeah. I talk in the codependency chapter about these dynamics and how we engage people. And there's actually predictable patterns between the addict and those that enable them. Um, And one of those mitigating factors is simply intensity, where that is what keeps the relationship together. That's what makes people feel close. And when we have a couple that is looking at this way forward, you cannot hope to have the healthy relationship later. You have to start it now. And one of the ways that you rid intensity and you engage vulnerability and intimacy Um, is creating boundaries and expectations outside of that immediate moment. If you say things and you threaten things in the moment and with high levels of anxiety, that's an ultimatum and it hardly if ever works, right? And so for those that want to have this change, you have to have effective boundaries that you understand, you can agree to, you have other people that will help you live them out. And once you present it that way and intensity is yanked out of the dynamic, that's where the addict can really decide if that vulnerability or that intimacy is worth it, if they're willing to engage that or not. But the partner gets the ability to make a decision in peace and can move on with their lives at that point if that's what plays out. Can you, that's a... Yeah, you do outline the difference between ultimatums and boundaries. So, yeah, can you kind of trying to think of any personal examples here that we yeah. work through? But yeah, just give some examples of kind of like clear distinctions. I mean, you kind of did there, but like how those ultimatums pop up in the moment and what a healthy boundary looks like over time as opposed to an ultimatum. The ultimatums that often are expressed are things like, I'm going to leave you if, or I'm taking the kids if, or I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. And they're both made up and spoken in levels of high emotional intensity. You find another bottle, right? Or also let's take addiction out of it altogether. You see a message from an ex-girlfriend on Facebook, right? That's where this super high level comes from. Uh, Boundaries are different, and I outline a way to see them and a way to utilize them where they're not just made in the calm, but they're founded on specific things. Um, You have the posts in the ground, because I talk about it as a fence. You have the posts in the ground are the core beliefs and values that you have, right? Those are, you know, I want to live a healthy life. I want to see progression. I want our kids to be loved. Those are the unshakable things that nobody's going to argue with, right? Um, Then you have the boards that are across. These are the specific expectations that are rooted in the beliefs that you have. So I expect you to go to all of your therapy appointments because it'll help you love your kids better and it'll help love me better and we can move forward, right? Those are rooted in the core beliefs. And then finally is the little warning sign and I'm from the American South. And so our warning signs are maybe a little bit culturally jarring. (laughs) (laughs) Maybe you guys up in Canada. Um, But we uh, sometimes we have signs like, um, you know, due to the rising cost of ammo, no warning shots will be fired. Right. (laughs) 
Yeah. Um, so it, it's that if this happens, this is what's going to follow through. If you right. cross these boundaries, if you go through this, this is what's going to happen. And that sign is clearly posted. You're not hiding anything. But if anybody comes up to that boundary, they know exactly what to expect. And so you're not acting on rage. You're not acting on whatever it is. There's a clear understanding of what's expected. If they break it, you're not doing anything crazy. You're just following through on what was already spoken about. Right. And can you, so from that point, as you said uh, some, somewhat earlier, where I work with a lot of teens to, um, and what I often try to guide parents to see is their role in the teen's behavior, right? And so, so at that point, if, if the sign, you know, partner A comes up to the sign, breaks a rule or et cetera, how or how have you worked with couples or people to deal with their own issues that cause them not to hold the boundary kind of thing? Because that, like, it's so hard for people. So you can get boundaries that are individually driven, but that typically comes from a healthier long-term perspective, right? Like I, I have boundaries for myself and my wife and she has them for me. Like some basic ones are don't ram a car into the house. <laughs> That's a boundary we have, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. But when you look at people that are in the midst of struggling, oftentimes boundaries are supported by other people. Um, and I, I talk a lot about having um, a partner or a spouse finding others that have gone through it. And so maybe you're not so great at building fences, but you can call on a neighbor who is, and they can help you engage this well until you feel comfortable enough to do it on your own. And then you can build them however you see fit. Just remember, and that's where things like Al-Anon, right? Or are having mm -hmm. sort of recovery groups or peers that can help you is so useful. Mm -hmm. um, did you talk about it in the book to not to sort of say, I'm going to leave if you do blank and then blank happens and you leave and you got nowhere to go. <laughs> so mm -hmm. yeah, I think you mentioned like having some sort of plan in place for, sure. for when the boundary gets crossed and you have to take action. Mm -hmm. A lot of times just having that follow through does enough, but you have to mean it. So I'll have spouses that will have what we call go bags where literally they'll just pack up everything they would need for like a week and they keep it in a suitcase. And so if that boundary is crossed, it isn't, oh, let me get everything together. It's they know where they're going. They know what's happening. They're gone. I have other people that have said, you know, gone the more drastic route where they'll talk about divorce and they have um, a lawyer on speed dial and they'll show the partner, this is who I'm calling. As soon as this happens, I'm following through. And so it's more of a trigger than it is a buildup at that point. And so that boundary is dependent on what the person can actually agree to and is aligned with their values. But I've even had couples in here where I'll say, all right, tell her you're going to divorce her. Show her the number. And she'll sit here and be really angry. And I'll just sit here super calm and say, I don't know what you want from me. This is what he said he's going to do and he's going to follow through. Right. And I guess, how do you think about or how do you help guide that person in the couple to really act on that, right? Because there's so much, as you said earlier, it's hard for people to accept that they get something out of the enabling or out of the allowing mm -hmm. themselves to be part of the system. Is it, is it, you work with their sort of beliefs, their fears, their sense of inadequacy or whatever. There's some sort of fear wrapped up in if I'm alone that I have to deal with my own problems. Kind of idea. So in a, in an environment where someone's deep in addiction, the one thing that I don't want to do as a therapist is overstress the partner past what they can handle. And so a lot of the beginning discussions are more what they need uh, and some light recognition that they're having an influence on all of this because 
I can't imagine going through all of the, the addiction for all of those years and barely keeping your head above water and then having a therapist give you weight to hold. And so a lot of the beginning of it is just saying, hey, here's what's happening. This is what's going on. This is what's going to happen next if you don't follow through. And then you lead into it after, you know, things follow through, then we get more into it. So at the beginning, it's much more recognition and acknowledgement than actually working on it. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. And I love your forthrightness, I guess, at certain points in the book <laughs> where you say, like, I'm going to get on a soapbox kind of idea uh, or a rant. I want to really, sure. I, I really admire a couple, well, like that, your, the way that you are in that way. And it comes out in some really nice ways. And I definitely agree in terms of how, I'm just going to read this and then we can talk about it. So say many practitioners have attempted to convince addicts that their addiction is outside of them. And others have said that it is not their fault. Both are wrong. Addiction is not a set of particular symptoms. It is also not something that happens without the will of an individual. Addiction is something that has slowly eaten someone away over time. Sure, they were not addicted to alcohol when they were a teenager, but they did sacrifice relationships for their own selfish desires. Retirement did not bring on addiction, but decades of distraction from their soul and relationships with others did. Addiction is not special, but the result of years of unresolved pain and self-centered ambition. That's mm -hmm. nice and like right to the kind of point. <laughs> That's also, I, I would say, like very much in alignment with the AA understanding, right? The mm -hmm. self-centered nature of addiction. Um, sure. Yeah. Can you maybe just talk a bit more of that? Or have you seen couples or worked with people who kind of were marred in believing that like, this is somehow no one's to blame here. So therefore, yeah. One of the biggest reasons that I wrote this book is for the partners of addicts that I've seen in therapy and they experience incredible trauma. I mean, we, we talk so much and there's so much research about, you know, the trauma of an overdose and what that does to an addict or alcohol poisoning or DUIs and all of that. And that's all well and good, but, what about the person who has sat through all of it and hasn't been able to drink? They've had to sit through all of this and they haven't been able to use drugs. What happens to them, right? If we just look at them and say, you know what, this is just a disease. It's something you're going to have to learn and work with. That looks to the partner in the family and says, sorry, deal with it. And I have had too many clients come in and just feel like they have nothing to stand on when in reality they have years worth of trauma, not just secondary trauma, but things that they've experienced and witnessed themselves. So for me, that was one of the biggest points in writing this whole book is to those left behind, <laughs> the ones that aren't given a voice in all of this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I'm gonna read it's sort of like from the next page. Um, so you say, how incredibly short-sighted and selfish it is to blame addiction on the disease and tell loved ones that they should just accept what happened because someone was quote unquote sick. So many families and significant others are robbed of the opportunity to work on their own pain because a recovering addict was told it was not their fault. I love this. This is absolute garbage. <laughs> <laughs> Addicts are responsible for their past actions and future work. If we do not present them with the ability to recognize their power in a decision, then we also cripple them in recovery efforts. Without engagement in the pain and decisions that someone caused, addicts must simply wait for it all to fall apart again. Isn't that how a disease works? You just wait for it to come back and everyone else has to deal with it. Yeah. Amazing. Amazing. I'm not known for... Uh holding back in things like writing and public speaking. <laughs> but I mean, it, it's absolutely, it's absolutely the truth. You, you end up with a prejudice of low expectations. Yeah. Yeah. And you, terrible. you, you hand addicts like, look, you know, it's not your fault. You know, you're just learning things. It's a disease. And you, you treat them with like little kid gloves and you say, you know what, buddy, it's not your fault. You know, we're all learning here and all of that. They're not children. They might emotionally be, 
because I write about that, but yeah, you, yeah. You, you can't hand them the emotional responsibility of a 12 year old and wonder why they can't grow into the adult parent or spouse that they need to be. It just doesn't work that way. Yeah. And maybe I'm just thinking about in terms of the complex mental illness stuff, I think it's maybe a good opportunity to just insert that concept. Like for my brother, who lives with schizophrenia, probably brought on by drug use, probably mostly cannabis, um, probably a miracle. And I remember psychiatrists telling me it's a miracle. I didn't develop schizophrenia as well, since I have sort of the genetic predisposition. Until, so my brother for 10 years, probably a bit longer, drugs, jail, yeah, mental health institution, community service, back into the home, drugs, jail, mm -hmm. like that went on for quite a while. Mm -hmm. And until my mom was like, you're going to live on the street or you're going to have to live in community housing, which I don't know about down there, but here it's not pleasant. It's not great. <laughs> no, but until that happened, he... It's hard to know exactly. Um, I actually have a podcast episode with him where I try to pull this stuff out of him. But he, until that happened, he would not embrace mm -hmm. the fact that he was really sick and mm -hmm. or, or maybe, yeah, and do the things he had to do, so to speak. So I think that's a good example, right? In some sense of like, look, you might be sick and got all kinds of issues, but you're still responsible. And I do believe like people in psychosis or whatever, um, I've had many encounters on the street or in public spaces where people in psychosis kind of come up to me and they or whatever i i remember one thing in particular i was at a public library and in toronto our public library system is quite vast and it often is a home right for homeless people in some sense mm -hmm. and some guy came up to me my wife and kids and another parent and their kids uh and was something like kind of looked at me he's like i can't remember he said something like the godfather's coming after you like stop touching your kids we're gonna get you blah 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 blah. and i just paused for a second and i looked him right in the eye and i was like are you okay mm -hmm. and he just froze and he walked away mm -hmm. but the, i guess the point of telling that story is i do think from the days and hours and months maybe that i've spent in psychiatric institutions with my brother most of the time a part of these people when they're in psychosis that is present and is aware sure. and always trying to speak to that mm -hmm. so even in those cases i think part of that knows they are responsible for their their shit. absolutely yeah and then but that gets and i know it's a pretty bad scene in the us right now it's similar here in canada on the west coast at least where the weather is good but Mm -hmm. We've just completely let go of this idea that if you're mentally ill and an addict, you're not responsible or, or we just have to let you be. It's just madness. Yeah. It's, you know, this is one of the things that drives me absolutely insane because as a clinician working in those mental health facilities, and my favorite joke is I can't tell you how many times I've met Jesus in mental health facilities. <laughs> yeah. I've met a white Jesus. I've met a Hispanic yeah. Jesus. I've met a black Jesus. Yeah. Like, <laughs> right. Yeah. That part of the mental health. Okay. We'll, we'll work on that. What was absolutely maddening is for us to say, this is what we need. This is how we need to do it. And the family goes, eh, <laughs> like the, you, you need to hold them accountable. You need to do all this. Well, I don't know. And we're, they got arrested. What are you talking about? You don't know. And then you come, especially um, in places, California, like San Francisco's turned into an absolute yeah. dystopian yeah. nightmare. Yeah. And I, I truly believe one of the biggest things is you have the government trying to be the family, but it's disconnected. And it's very much just about, what can we offer and give with no accountability? And so, you know, homeless, if, if you interview them, they're like, hey, you know, let's get you housing. Let's get you all of this. And I don't want housing. I'm fine. And so we're throwing all of these things that one, a lot of them don't even want. Um, but two, we're not engaging the family system ahead of time. And then we're trying to be the family after it's all fallen apart. And I, I truly believe those two things are related because 
family is the most protective measure you can have. Like I have mental health disorders. My family kept me from going all the way off the deep end. That doesn't mean I don't have them, but it does mean that it was managed way earlier to the point where I'm completely independent. I have no issues now. Yeah. And I'm glad you brought that point up too. Yeah. Because without, I think, I think there's research on this particularly, but people who do have complex mental illness and have family support have, I mean, it's not rocket science, but have much better outcomes, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> what a surprise. Um, do, do you know much about the deinstitutionalization kind of movement? And as far as I understand it, the, the resources were supposed to be reinvested in other forms or treatment models or whatever. Of course, that didn't happen, right? But clearly, whatever we're doing now is not working. There's an area in Vancouver, East Hastings Street, which which is, I love, you say, I'm going to steal the words of dystopian nightmare. It's fucking insane. Like in Vancouver, you see these beautiful mountains. It's Vancouver's a beautiful place. Mm -hmm. And then you go downtown to East Hastings and for about a kilometer or half a mile, maybe a mile, it's just junkies and drugs. Mm -hmm. And you can see people shooting up. I mean, it's just crazy. Mm -hmm. And it obviously it is an incredibly difficult thing to do. I, I think I try sure. to teach my kids. My brother's like pretty well now. He works and which is amazing. Like he's got a relatively good life. But when we see people on the street yelling and screaming at nothing or homeless people and my kids kind of get curious or whatever, mm -hmm. um, I guess what I try to understand myself and help them understand is it is so difficult to help somebody in that situation. Sure. Yeah. So how, how do you, I don't, I mean, I don't, I know you don't assume to have an answer, so to speak, but like what, how do we as a society move in the direction of something that's like more effective for these people? So as a marriage and family therapist, and that being what I write a lot about, what I speak about, and all of that, that I, I truly believe that the degradation of the family has pushed the government into being the family, because you can actually track with people groups, you know, things like um, single parent households, right? That they have this skyrocket amount of mental health and addiction, right? Does that mean that they're specifically worse people? No, it doesn't. But it does mean that there's certainly a reason for it. And so what unfortunately has ended up happening in the U.S. because we're so disconnected from charity and welfare um, is that you just say, we'll throw more money at it. No, um, but that's what it's ended up being. And it's almost developed into this narrative of, well, if you don't throw more money at it, you must hate them. And instead of the accountability, right, instead of taking that institutional stuff and saying, here's the opportunity, if you don't take it, sorry, we're not giving you anything else. Here's the way out. It's free. Do it. If not, I'm not going to hand you crack pipes. I'm not going to hand you all of these things because if you don't experience the consequence now, it will come later, as AA will say in jails, institutions, and in death. I'd rather you experience an overdose now than an, a year from now when your use has increased and then you have an overdose. And so for me, it's just pushing pushing it further and further down in the name of being loving and caring. The idea around the boundary between compassion and responsibility and this pseudo, I'm a good person because mm. I'm allowing this person to slowly kill themselves kind of idea. It's, it's very, it's so, it's hard to often like put a finger on it. And it's very hard, I find, for people to, I don't know if it's defenses or projections, but it's very hard for people to accept that that is a real thing and that it really hurts. It, it's harmful, I guess, or it, it's not conducive to good outcomes. So let me be clear on a lot of my position. I'm going to start my dissertation research um, in late fall. Um, I hope to do it in my local jail, the Rutherford County Jail, focusing on relapse and recidivism. 
I have a great heart for all of these things. I want it to be better. My perceiving, seemingly harsh demeanor has nothing to do whether I care about people or I'm looking down on them. I've actually devoted the whole five years of my PhD work and hopefully a future part of my career to helping these people, right? And so for me, this is the marriage of all of those where we would rather feel good by posting about it or throwing $5 and seeming like we're virtuous than actually engaging and pushing past the people that are looking for money and saying, okay, so what actually works here? In the US, we call the virtue signaling is absolutely atrocious. Um, but that's what a lot of it is. Look at me, I'm a good person because I want them to have these resources instead of holding them accountable, which is actually more helpful. Yeah, yeah, it is out of control. Um, the virtue signaling kind of stuff. But I think, and at the same time, it's understandable why people do that because. Mm -hmm. In some sense, it's just easier. And it does take a little bit of courage and humility to look at ourselves and acknowledge that. Although at the same time, we're just so resistant to it. It is, mm -hmm. it is, um, well, I don't know. It, yeah. the, one of the big risks of helping these people is that I get dirty, right? And so if you want to help the homeless guy on the side of the road, don't just hand him money. You can give food, I guess. Um, why don't you point him towards resources that already exists? But in order to really help people that desperately need help, if we refuse to get dirty ourselves, then all we're doing is perpetuating it further, but it makes us feel good. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. It's so, it's such a real issue and it is that simple in some sense. And at the mm -hmm. same time, people again, just, don't want to accept those facts mm -hmm. and fair in fairness i don't blame them i say like, who wants to do that's incredibly difficult work sitting in hospital I, you know for my own experience going to get my brother out of jail and sitting and i was a disaster at the time too but mm -hmm. it's a lot of hard work and sometimes i would prefer if we just said that you know what it's actually really hard and complicated <laughs> and nobody wants to do it and that's why we're not solving the problem it's for sure hard. yeah yeah and especially and this is one of the things that i wrote the book for is so i'm i'm a therapist in the states the insurance stuff with the states and mental health is a nightmare and so unethical um so some people can't afford the rates so i wrote a book about it so instead of me sitting here and grandstanding and saying, oh, well, we should help all these people, why don't you go do something about it? If you're going to complain about it, go do something about it, right? And so people can't afford the hourly rate for therapy. Well, here's a $15 book. And while it might not be the same thing, we're doing something, something actually productive. And that's the big thing for me as you know, especially in addiction, it gets expensive because rehab's expensive. <laughs> and so um, instead of saying, this is the only way you can get help is by coming to my, you know, great shrine where we talk about all the magical things. It's, okay, what can I do to help people that might not be able to afford it because their spouse drained everything? Right. Okay, I want to ask you what I also appreciated about the book is sort of the the, the containers or the way you help frame a lot of these ideas and put them into coherent ideas. <laughs> uh, can you explain a little bit, sort of, if we get a little academic for a minute, just like a bit about family systems and then also towards, I can remember this in the middle or the end, you sort of tie in the emotion focused therapies. Mm -hmm. And so that, and then I want to ask you about the, when you talk about working with individual clients, how you help with those three boxes of sort of random life stuff, mm -hmm. your symptoms and illness and what you can do about it. No idea. So maybe mm -hmm. just start with the family system stuff and that EFT and that. Sure. Yeah. The example that I give in the book is the American Midwest, where as um, we were migrating West, we realized that there were these things that could kill us called wolves. 
And so we started wiping them out because we didn't want to die. Fair. I get that, right? But the ecosystem started to shift to where there were deer that were outliving when they were supposed to because wolves killed the sick ones. They killed the undersized ones, right? And so that population increased. Well, if the deer increase, so the other things that they eat decrease, right? And so in an ecosystem like that, even just introducing and moving things around has a drastic effect. Um, one of the ways that we've solved it, funnily enough, and sorry if there are any actable, animal activists listening, we kill deer to save the forest. <laughs> um, in therapy with family systems, you have to think of it this way, where if you make a shift in one area, it's going to shift dynamics with everybody else. You cannot take an addict in treatment and quote unquote fix them and send them back, right? Let's say you really did cure them, right? You send them back. If nobody else has changed, they're often unconsciously going to force them back into that addictive role, right? So you cannot just work on one person and it, this doesn't have to be therapy. It can simply be explanation or engagement or whatever it is. Um, you can't send them back and expect it all to be better. And that's what a lot of family systems and couples therapy is, is engaging that holistic aspect where everything shifts when you make a change. For EFT, emotionally focused therapy, I really love this because it engages the emotional and intimacy dynamic where we go around simply what our inclinations or impulses are and we get into the vulnerability between couples right? We start to really say what's underneath. My favorite modern phrase is we say the quiet part out loud. Um, we start to really engage and bring up those things. It's beautiful for two reasons. One, it's one of the most effective couples therapies in general. Two, you can really target what addicts are really needing, as well as what their partners were missing or getting from it, right? Because, you know, I can get anybody sober, I think was the phrase, I can get anybody sober for 50 bucks and a bunch of zip ties, right? Getting people sober isn't the problem, right? And so if we can engage it, and I love EFT for this because we really get down and you change the interaction and I can almost mold an ecosystem within a session and then you send it out and you see how it interacts for the week and then they come back and you make more adjustment, Right. And then they go back out to the point where they don't need me anymore. They just come back and go, well, we were fighting. We're not fighting so much. Now we're just talking and we've worked it out. So that's the big reason that I love the, all of that stuff is they go exist without me. They fire me and I'm happy about that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And maybe to maybe this is my own understanding, but also I think having personal examples or real like is helpful. So maybe you can help clarify. So when I, when I decided to stop getting high and drinking and what all the things I was doing, I told my wife, I used to be a professional poker player. Okay. So that's sort of funny how, how it fits into the whole thing. Cause poker was actually the one thing that I did not do compulsively and that I <laughs> kind of managed with integrity and because it was my lifeline. If I didn't have poker, God knows what would have happened to me. Um, so I said to her, I can't, I am, I, I went to this outpatient recovery program and I started to realize how batshit crazy I was. <laughs> and I said to my wife, I need time off work. I can't mm -hmm. play poker right now. I'm a fucking, like I'm, I mm -hmm. start to learn how crazy I was. And why I had to be high 24 hours a day. And her response and in fairness to her i had money or i was successful in that way like what's the big deal weed is your problem like no mm -hmm. like we need to pay the bills and like no <laughs> you're not taking you can take a week off or something like that sure so in that moment and i think this for me this applies to that letter we read through earlier for me i had to make a decision that like i don't care what other what she says like i need to take care of myself therefore i'm going to do whatever i need to do to sober up mm -hmm. um so i lied to her about working 
And that was like a big step eight, nine thing for me. Okay. To, to tell her eventually that I was lying to her about working. Mm -hmm. So in that moment, I think like what I needed was acknowledgement and validation and acceptance. Mm -hmm. What she needed was maybe, I don't, well, I guess like some sort of a reassurance that we weren't going to lose our house and da, 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 da. But like, because maybe you can just like pick that apart a little bit because I withdrew and lied mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and said, fuck her, <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and she kind of, you know, like, again, this was all on me. Like, it's not really her fault. I don't blame her for that or whatever. And we sort of worked through that uh, over a few years or whatever. But anyhow, maybe just like in that moment, you get two people together. One person says, I need this. The other person says, hell no. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like what's going on there, I guess. So yeah. Mike, how uncomfortable are you willing to be today? <laughs> Oh, I love it. I love it. It's okay. good all the time. I love it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. So one of the big things that I look for is what has become the stand-in for intimacy and relationship, right? And so if I had a couple in front of me and one of them said exactly what you said and the wife said the other thing, my initial thought with the wife would be, okay, so she's probably not a psychopath. Um, why is she demanding that this happen. And some of my initial guesses would be like, okay, so maybe she doesn't even trust that he can make things work. And this is a compromise for what can happen. Or it could be that, look, I've already wanted to divorce you. This is the one thing that I need to be stable. Or maybe it's a step thing where there's, you know, maybe if you can accomplish this, then we can move to this. Or, you know, maybe there's some of her own issues in it where it's like, uh, no, I suffered all of this time, you dumbass. Now give me the things that I need, right? Yeah. So yeah. from an EFT lens, that's immediately where I would start thinking. Obviously, I don't lead with that because people get you know, real vulnerable. Yeah. If they get that too quickly, yeah. Yeah. they don't come back. Um, <laughs> but like for you, it'd be more of what is that sense of fear and vulnerability being honest about it, right? What is it that is wanting, keeping you engaging that? Some of the big questions would be like, are you willing to lose the house if that means that you had a better relationship? Or what is it that you're willing to risk to see if this will work? And being able to be open and honest about that is a huge ordeal because a lot of times it's much less the practical things as it is what's lying underneath. And so that's where I get a lot of the couples things is especially in like relapse and recovery, they'll say big things like that. When in reality, they just either want their spouse back and don't know how to ask for it, or they have given them a prejudice of low expectations. So they'll take what they can get. Or maybe they have a sense of retribution where it's, hey, dummy, I've suffered for this for 10 years. Give me something, too. So all of that is in play. It's just kind of dependent on, like, what their history is and how they act in session. Sort of in reflection and in our couples therapy and just as we work through this over the years. For me, I had wanted to sober up since literally I started getting high at 12. And literally I was high 24 hours a day till I was 30. So for me, it was like, yeah, it was fucking crazy to be honest. <laughs> I, I was convicted of trafficking drugs in high school, like just madness. I managed to hold it together to convince myself and her it was a good idea to get married. Uh, Cause I thought that would save me in some sense. So mm -hmm. we had only been married for, I don't even think that long, eight months or something, nine months together for a few years. So for me, it was, I wanted to sober up probably since I was 15, that the conscience in my head had been telling me this forever. Finally, something happened in which I could listen and act on that voice. So nothing is going to stand in the way of me and this happening. And that sure that might have been sort of selfish or, or I don't know, but I was willing to lose everything. For her, obviously, totally different story. I'm not willing to lose everything, you know, that kind of yeah. stuff. And fair to her, but it's not judgment at all. I mean, good for her. And so then and where, where really a lot of the amends had to come and where I really had to carry the burden was I lied to her, right? So I said mm -hmm. I was playing poker. I basically, 
I used to play quite high stakes. I basically was playing for pennies or dollars. Uh, I wasn't losing money, but I wasn't making money. And I was spending money that I had saved that I told her I would save. Uh -huh. right. So that was the thing that I was lying about, where the money was coming from. And, mm -hmm. and then once I, you talk about this in the book too, the deep emotional shame, like all, once I had about a year and a bit of recovery and I had dealt with some of my own shame and guilt and self-hatred and all that shit, that's so hard to work through. I got to the point where I said, okay, I don't hate myself. I'm not a useless piece of shit. Mm -hmm. I'm going to tell her about this and deal with the consequences. Mm -hmm. And at this point we had our first kid was born. So that complicated matters, of course. <laughs> uh, you know? Yeah. And so obviously she was pissed, you know, no doubt. Like, again, this was all on me. And so we had to work through that. And at some point, and this is the miracle of Alan on an AA or just the miracle of like recovery, however we want to define that. And I do want to ask you kind of for detail about the step stuff, but uh, where she could acknowledge how this goes back to the disease model too. If I had come to her and said, I have cancer, I, I can't work. I need treatment. She would have said, fine, sure. We'll sell the house, whatever. Um, and obviously it's not the same thing. Exactly. So at some point she could acknowledge her part in the situation. That's when really we started to put everything back together and about the so mature. I don't know if that kind of makes sense, but no, it's the it has to it, it's the what, what do we do with all of this stuff now? Like now we're caught in the middle of all of it, and right. we right. were dealing right. with the fallout. Um, people's boundaries can move. They can, you know, especially I I've worked with couples where it's if you drink one more time, I'm getting a divorce. And then six months later, once they've seen progress, it's if you drink, we're coming to therapy twice a week. Right, right. And so right. as we as we move forward in therapy and in work, those can move and shift. And I prefer to value marriage and relationships and not overvalue a disease model. And so I see the hope and future in a healthy marriage rather than trying to compensate just to get people's heads above water. Right. And, and where, where do you balance the, this is a lot of the stuff we work through in the marriage counseling, but like the harm that I had caused her in mm -hmm. the lying about the money and the work and just being, I, you also talk in the book about whether or not someone's quote unquote, like cheating on their spouse. The addiction is cheat, like it's emotional cheating or whatever. Mm -hmm. So yeah, once sort of that shifted and and like it was sort of like working through my side of it. So how do you kind of think about or work with or just from maybe examples like the addicts recovering, changing, becoming uh, hopefully a better person. The other person's got their stuff to work through. But where does that, maybe it's a boundary thing or the ball of responsibility lie? Like, I, I think maybe it's a bit harsh in some sense, but at some point I was like, I'm not the problem anymore. Mm -hmm. Like if, if we're going to yeah go on, like you got to deal with your shit too. There's a fundamental dynamic shift that has to take place. Um, the emotional affair part is incredibly important because it helps give voice to what partners are feeling. Um, if you were to just change the dynamic and say, well, um, I'm sleeping with um, this woman that I met. Okay. Um, then all of a sudden afterward, you say, well, you know, I've got to work on myself. She's going to say, bitch, what you mean? <laughs> like you're going to go work on yourself. Right. Okay. And, you know, let's say that he does, you know, get all of that healing and then tries to switch over to her, there's still an emotional affair. I mean, it's marked by intensity because it is rather intense to say, hey, this big thing happened. Let's not talk about it. And so the fundamental shift that has to happen is there are 
points of personal responsibility, but instead of it being this person against this person, we put the couple against the problem, right? So it's, okay, how can the two of us work against addiction and what led up to it? You have stuff, you have stuff. That's fair, okay? We're not gonna kick that away, but how do we put you against this, right? And that separate thing, um, and I've even had this outside of addiction, like significant mental health issues, is how do we take the two of you against her severe depression? How do we make it this problem that you and I can join against, right? And so we stop identifying as the sickness. We stop identifying as, oh, well, I've just got to work on myself. No, you're not by yourself. You are with a partner. You need to do your own stuff. But it is not helpful to say, I'm going to go work over here and you're going to go work over here. It's the same thing with the therapist, right? Where you separate them in divorce, you bring them back together they're still going to be pissed <laughs> because they didn't join in it. So that's the short version of the paradigm shift. Right. And does that, can you, you talk about the, you have a lot of nice sort of metaphors or analogies like the bicycle with the kickstand and the it, in, in triangulation. Can you sort of clarify the triangulation? I think that's what you're alluding to there, but just like what triangulation looks like in that situation, or I guess with, between me and my wife or other people. Sure. Triangulation is something we've known in family systems outside of addiction. Uh, this, this came about a while ago. And the basic idea of it came from when mom and dad cannot resolve their issues. They often will find something to put their issues off onto. Um, typically, that's a kid. And I use, admittedly, some cultural references um, here, yeah, but, yeah. <laughs> but, but my two favorite are the, you know, here in the South, we are obsessed with sports, which is hilarious. Cause none of these kids are going pro and people are losing their religion over it. Um, <laughs> but the thing is, is when they can't address their stuff, when the bicycle and each person being a wheel in the bicycle, when that's not moving and that's not transitioning, but they still want to stay upright, they put off their problems onto a kid. And so that kid is either the best thing that has ever existed, or they're oftentimes the worst thing that has ever existed. And we blame all of our stuff on them. Right. And so we see that in family systems without addiction. Right. However, in addiction, we have that triangle between partners and addiction. So it's the same sort of idea where it's, I don't want to or can't address my stuff. I can't want to, don't want to address my stuff. Let's blame the addiction. Because, I mean, theoret theoretically, what's easier to say? Um, I have this crippling fear that my eight-year-old was right and that no one will ever love me and everything here is a sham or I have a drinking problem. <laughs> and so it becomes the source of where we put all of our stuff in that way. And so that's the basics of triangulation. Right. And then, as you say, is it let's bring the couple together and turn to that. So the couple is just one line and then the triangulation is the other issue. Mm -hmm. So it's, do you bring, you bring the two people on the same page, same team, Mm -hmm. against what they're dealing with. Is that yeah, right? it, it turns from a triangle to an upside down T where it's okay. the two of us yeah. engaging yeah. this thing, which right. interestingly enough, I said this had originally nothing to do with addiction. Uh, one of the highest rates of divorce outside the first two years of marriage is when all the kids leave the home because that bicycle has been sitting on a kickstand for so long that you knock out those kickstand and all of a sudden the bike is rusted and broken down and they don't know who they are, or who the other person is. Right. But if you take a couple and they can join together, and of course you're going to have unique relationships. Like my daughter loves to play outside more with my wife than me, but she also loves listening to Metallica with me. Right. And so there's, there's unique aspects but she doesn't get to split us and we have relation, like meaningful emotional connection that at least is not acknowledged and shared with the other parent. Yeah, it's so, it's so interesting. Um, I, I guess 
I'm also looking at the time. I could pick your brain forever. Um, well, Mike, you just got to have me yeah. back then. Yeah, okay, deal, <laughs> deal, deal, deal. Okay, good. Uh, so then I don't feel under pressure to, um, to ask. So I guess as as I was making amends for our line jar about the working staff, and, I mean, I eventually did go back to playing poker uh, until my second kid was born. And when I was ready to go back to school and do this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I guess so as I was making amends to her, she was learning to trust me again. Mm -hmm. We were working through that in therapy. Um, she acknowledged her part in the thing. Like at some point she was like, yeah, maybe that wasn't nice of me to say to you. You can't, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> you can't go to treatment. Uh, you go to work and your problems aren't a big deal. Um, so she came around on that, which I greatly admire her for. And, um, also there's a lot of boundaries there too. For me at some point, it was just like, no, <laughs> here's the sign. I had a very clear sign for her, <laughs> um, on my nicely, uh, built fence. And so she went to Al-Anon, she did some of her, I, I just like in this moment, I'm accessing my admiration for her, for really going through it's almost hard i think it's harder for the partner or the family member to accept their part in the situation and to actually do something about it because yeah i mean in, in fairness it's like well <laughs> they're not really the problem and so if they have you know to uh, they contribute to it but like so I, so as she was working through that i guess we we did turn into that upside down T in a sense and like, okay, we're on the same page. We don't want to get divorced. We want to have, you know, a relatively happy home and to raise our kids together. Da, da, da. Um, and so, yeah, I guess we did merge into that unit. I, I still, she, I'm not going to speak for her, but clearly I also, like, I still have remnants. You talk about this in the book too, like the long-term recovery and the, like, these things are going to come up. I do get triggered into that withdrawing kind of idea of like, I want to mm -hmm. run and hide. She's the bad guy. <laughs> and if she would just change my life would be better. A hundred percent. Yeah. 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 <laughs> um, and, and this kind of ties into a little bit of what you said earlier in terms of like, this is not a like six session, 10, 12 session thing. How, how, how do you help guide people or in your experience, how have people dealt with the reality that this is a long-term thing? And of course we get better and healthier and we're humans. No one's perfect, but how do you see couples heal long-term or people heal long-term And as a therapist? How do you fit into that picture? Part of dealing with that is the beginning of our conversation. Okay, so if this is not a disease, right? <laughs> holy shit, how did it come this far? Right? Um, maybe this has been building for two decades. Does that mean it takes two decades of therapy? Well, no, right? But once you can extract that disease model idea and you can put together how things have built, um, then people can see, oh, so this isn't just I tripped and fell into addiction, right? Um, the other part is, you know, we have this idea because of the disease model of let's get the treatment and then we can move on, right? Unfortunately, <laughs> that's not really the case. And, you know, am I an advocate for therapy? Well, yeah, obviously I'm a therapist, Um but you can absolutely do work on your own, but the chances are that you have these rather large blind spots, which got you to the place where you were. And so buying into therapy long term can be more of what are you willing to sacrifice in order to have this better life, right? Would you be willing to reduce your risk of relapse by 80%? But you have to drive this way, drive, a 2015 Corolla for the next two years, right? You can't upgrade your car. You can't do any of that. You have to put all the money into therapy. Would you be willing to do that? And typically the people that say yes don't have to be here nearly as long. <laughs> the people that say no, they'll come for a few months 
and then they'll just kind of float off and then I'll see them a year later, right? And so for what is it worth to you? What is it worth to sit and really address this? And are you willing to let me ask questions like, what did you get out of him overdosing for the third time? And once people can engage that, that's a big part. If they have kids, the best thing that I can do for them is look over and say, if you do not fix this, they will either mirror it or repeat it because of how kids work and how they learn. If you do not address the, your issues, your kid will either become the addict in either direct or symbolically, or they'll become an enabler, either direct or um, in support or whatever it is. And so it's not just you. It's not just your partner. If you are going to have kids or if you already have kids and you don't get on this, they have a very high likelihood of either becoming an addict or being married to one. So, yeah. And that just brought up something you wrote in the book, which I wanted to pick your brain about, um, which was very much my situation was, or, or what I, I think helped me a lot was, if you put anything in front of your recovery, you're going to lose it. You write in there somehow, kind of how that can be unfair sometimes to the spouse or the family or whatever. Um, I guess I didn't have, my son was born, I think. My wife got pregnant with my first child. I was sober for two weeks. I was like, yeah, let's have kids. <laughs> 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 oh my god that's a whole another yeah. funny story but um i really did hold that to, i think i still do hold that to heart like i think i've been slacking a bit lately on my sort of meditation and in my kind of personal work but can you just say or maybe speak to that i understand that as actually a really helpful way to approach it um because i always told myself the story if i do put my recovery first then that means I'll be a better dad, a better husband, a better, et cetera. Yeah. And maybe, maybe you could talk about some of the problems with that approach. Too. I can't ever be upset about people grabbing life rafts. Right. <laughs> so somebody comes in and says, well, I have to keep my recovery first. I'm glad you're not dead. <laughs> like, yeah. Let's start there. I'm glad you're not dead. Um, unfortunately, Putting your recovery first means sacrificing other things. Sure. And if that means for your spouse, maybe they can be on board with it. But we talked about that earlier about sacrifices and low expectations. But also, is there a problem with teaching that to your kids too? Because kids don't quite understand all of that. And if dad's always at AA meetings, sure, you can explain that it's healthy for him. But he just knows dad isn't around. Right? Right. On the other hand, if this isn't a disease and addiction isn't the main issue, it's hard to validate that as the number one priority. If it is an attachment issue, which I talk about in the book, if it really is a systems issue and a relationship issue, and you were to put that second, then you're not giving it the full energy that you could be, right? Um, you're not engaging in what actually heals it all. Now, is recovery important? Well, duh, <laughs> right? Like you don't want yeah. to ruin your kid's college money because, you know, you decided to go out on a bender and blow everything. Right, right. I'm on board. But if you're a healthy spouse, if you're a healthy parent, well, of course you're going to do these little things that you need to in order to stay healthy. Yeah, that actually helps. I, I often, I don't know the way I think about things. I forget the nuances of certain things like that. So for me, this idea of putting my recovery first did not take away from being a dad or a spouse or whatever it enhanced. And I also do see situations where it takes away from, as you outlined, right? If dad's mm -hmm. always at the meetings or the this or the that, what the fuck? Like, that's yeah. my dad. I need that person here. Sure. Um, yeah. And I, I guess it helps me to formulate it in a way that's probably more thorough. Mm -hmm. um, I'm a very engaged parent, I guess. But mm -hmm. um, 
So when, so maybe it's some better to be something like, yeah, you can't have these things if you're not sober and taking care of yourself. And at the same time, all these other parts of your life are important and need to be integrated into this idea, right? Of recovery. Sure. Yeah. yeah. I, I've realized that for me and my mental health and the way that I do everything is I have to continually play and engage in a creative part of myself, particularly music. Like I love mm -hmm. guitar and I've spent too much money on guitars. Don't tell my wife I said that. Um, but that's something that I know that I need to upkeep. And I realize that when I'm not doing so well, that stuff naturally falls away and I come back to it. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, Although if I'm living a healthy life and keeping track of everything, I'm going to do it anyway. Yeah. Okay. Um, I guess it's sort of, I'm not sure kind of where to choose your own adventure idea. I want to ask you about maybe as a, as a individual, like clinician in terms of working with individuals, just what your thoughts are on sort of the process of the steps. And I, in my, I don't know if it's a delusion or not in my thoughts of going back to school to do a PhD in counseling psych, mm -hmm. I would probably focus on why the steps work, like psychologically speaking for sure. people. And I maybe so that's kind of maybe want to ask you if we take the principles of the steps, honesty, hope, mm -hmm. faith, courage, integrity, mm -hmm. humility. I mean, these are all nice sounding words, obviously, but they do actually transform people. Sure. And, yeah, I guess, and, and I do know, I've been to a couple of meetings when I would go to play the World Series, like when I was sober, I'd go to AA meetings in Vegas, and they <laughs> were definitely different than they are in Toronto. Oh, um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so there's obviously a different vibe, and I you actually pointed out in the book kind of like figuring out where that home for you is, mm -hmm. like don't just go to one meeting and make an assumption. And I don't think there's much literature on this, like, Mm -hmm. Why, if, if we were to take a biological, behavioral, um, moral, family systems lens to why the steps actually work and what they do for people, mm -hmm. can you maybe just speak to that and your experience of observing and what you know about it? So one thing I would caution you specifically, but also just in general, um, if you go to the 12 traditions, I can't remember if it's four or six. Um, it's AA will not lend out its name to any outside entity, Yes, which <laughs> makes it so that it's hard to do research on it because one yeah. of their traditions says that they're not going to do it. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah. And so I, I haven't really seen that acknowledged all that much. And so that, that's one thing that bothers me is people are like, well, there's all this research on AA and nobody talks about how they dealt with the tradition that says that you can't. Right. Yeah, um, yeah. But there are general veins in AA that I think are amazing. One of them being community, right? Mm. It, especially in modern Western men, I think it's especially prevalent here in America is the individualized, rugged man. And one of the great things about AA is you have a whole bunch of men that have said, that ain't it. <laughs> That's not what is, what's going to be helpful in uh, a lot of the protective factors is just knowing you have a community of people that will engage with you, right? There's also a set way to see a path forward, right? right. And, and different sponsors will, you know, say, well, you have to take a year on step one or you have to take all. Okay, fine. But in general, there's this idea that one, there's something outside of you, um, the whole faith part has sort of floated away over the past few decades and it's become more of this amorphous thing. Um, but there's a way to connect and serve other people. Um, and so for that, there's a lot of protective stuff because we know one of the best things against anxiety and depression is volunteer work and exercise. If you do right. both regular exercise and regular volunteer work, it tends to be comparable to medication or and sometimes better. And yep. so you get some of those factors within AA. Now, granted, there's too much coffee and too much smoking of cigarettes. That's a whole other <laughs> argument to be made. <laughs> but the, all of those things are protective factors. And so if there's research into it and seeing mm -hmm. the people who have engaged in what they've seen be different in their lives, not just, oh, this step did this and this step did this. That's where right. I think a lot of the benefit is. Right on. Yeah. 
Do you know uh, Anna Lemke? She wrote Dopamine Nation. I've heard of it before, it's but great. I haven't actually read it. Yeah. It's a great book. And she's a psychiatrist from Stanford. She teaches as well. She sort of is fond of the steps and has similar, I, I don't want to misquote her, that uh, she agreed to be on the podcast actually, which is so cool. So I don't want to misquote her, but like <laughs> uh, sort of the problems with the medicalization of mental illness and addiction, she touches sure. on that, which I admire better. And, but to your point here, she talks about pro-social shame, which mm. is, I think, and, and how AA is a great environment for to engage in pro social shame and I, you talked a lot about in the book which i definitely relate to personally but just more as a human being like shame guilt remorse it's it those are difficult deep emotions and we need to learn how to process them if we are to be free or healthy or whatever mm -hmm. um so yeah maybe just kind of, can you talk a little bit about shame, addiction, and this idea of pro-social shame, if, if that resonates with you? The definitions of guilt and shame, I think, are important, and they seem to shift depending on who you ask. I typically yes. define yeah. guilt is I did something wrong, and shame is I am something wrong. Yeah, that's, um, I, uh, that's my understanding, too. Yeah. So when it comes to pro-social shame, I tend to think of that as more guilt-based, or recognition of what you've become than it is you dumb alcoholic, get your shit together. You suck. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. Um, because that is prevalent in AA often. Eh? Like there's yeah. that kind of, you're a dumb alcoholic, like sit down, shut up, dude, whatever. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, to be fair, that's the intensity triangle. We're bound yeah. and you're bound to me by me telling you you're a dumbass. Right. 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 And <laughs> right. Is that, is that like, would that, would that be considered an unhealthy triangulation in AA for the people in AA that are, and it's important to acknowledge, my sponsor sure. always said, remember, you're in a room full of sick people. Okay, so. Yes, yeah. Just remember that. But sorry, kind of veering us off. You were talking okay. about shame. Yeah. yeah, and to answer that, yes, because it is absolutely can easily be a triangle because your anxiety is being mitigated in AA and not with the people that live life with you and need you to be anxious around them so they can solve issues. Um, when it comes to the shame specifically and the pro-social shame, there does need to be an element of accountability. You know, do you, do you go up and say, hey, I screwed up? What's the intention behind it? Is it for everybody to go, oh, buddy, and you treat them like a hurt puppy? Is it the, you know, we all sit there and throw tomatoes at you or something? Or is it a recognition and acknowledgement? Yeah, you screwed up. Now what are we going to do about it? I think that middle ground is where you see a lot of the positive benefits from it. Yeah. Yeah. It, uh, I think I just need to get more clear in my own thinking about this. My experience of AA and step work and Al-Anon, I did a lot of Al-Anon work myself too, was very positive. And I think because I, as they say, take what you like and leave the rest, I, I sort of was very careful about who I listened to and what guidance I followed. And I get that there's problems with it all for sure. And some people don't have good experiences. I don't even know what my question is or if I'm just talking out loud, like <laughs> how... Is it possible to create something like that in a therapeutic environment? And you, you write about in your book too, a bit about like group work and stuff. So mm -hmm. I'm curious, and maybe we can end on this. Um, we both have to get to work <laughs> soon. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, I guess a reflection on how groups and that, uh, that pro-social shame, like environment of like, yes, this is fucked up. I fucked up. What are we going to do about it? learning from each other, just how you see groups help people heal. One thing that I don't want to do is just create a group where it's just addicts, because I think there's enough of those. What I tend to prefer is for people to engage in social groups that they can engage in they ha or they haven't or the ones that they're already involved in. Whether that's friend groups, um, people will be connected to like religious institutions 
or things in that way because you to create a whole new environment you can create something similar to aa right um now these groups obviously need to have some understanding of addiction as it is right like you don't want to <laughs> you don't want to show up to a church and say i smoke crack what are you going to do about it <laughs> right uh sure. But having these groups that you already know you need to engage in, you're just ha- you just haven't, I think opens up a whole lot more into other aspects of life to where addiction and the results of it don't just become this idol we sacrifice to every day. That it's something that we can remember. It's something that we can acknowledge. But there's also so much more life to live than just being sober, right? Like if we engage with people that either, you know, they have been addicted and they're sober now or people that never have been, there's an element of hope to say, okay, they might not be like me, but that's what life can be. Right. And that's my big fear in creating a whole nother group is, well, we could end up just creating this thing where all we talk about is addiction and all we talk about is all of these problems. And then you kind of get it cycled and we start wearing our addiction like a badge. And is that sort of like, and are we going to stop talking? That's the, my my Buddhist sort of mindfulness self is that's where we get identified with things and and sort of, and that obviously creates more suffering and, and you do see that in AA a lot, right? Those people get super attached and identified to the 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 role or the whatever of being an alcoholic or addict, and therefore they sort of maybe cut themselves off from other potential I don't like identity as a sense of self but yeah here's here's the short version the people that have problems with that sound like the people that never grew up past high school and always go back and talk about high school right yeah that's awesome that's such a good uh, I'm gonna just say one more thing in so I'm part of marijuana anonymous in Toronto uh-huh. which is sort of a bunch of I mean, judgment, okay, judgment, bias, signal here. Bunch of people who don't think they have a problem. Sure. Um, they got caught up, this went all the way up to world service level with the word, they wanted to replace all the words God in the literature with higher power because mm-hmm. the argument was that it's sort of like oppressive to people who've been marginalized by God and religion. Like it was just so not the point of these groups and yeah. like you said it's like if we can't it took me a couple of years to be honest to get over that god stuff like to say sure. the word god because of my own interpretations of what that meant but mm-hmm. as you said i like how you put it it's like at least if i understand you right you can't get over some of the words and ideas because we're acting like children and like being stubborn and resentful or something like that mm-hmm. so, yeah i know what you meant yeah if you don't like the dynamic and you suggest something and they don't go for it, you can throw a fit or you can make something yourself. Right. <laughs> go make go make a separate group. You can right. even call it MA and just change the language. Like <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Okay, cool. So here I want to just share my, a little so we can get a video here. So the book is to those left behind helping partners and families understand and heal from addiction, comprehensive guide. We don't have much engagement on YouTube, but otherwise, if anyone comments and says, I want a book, we're going to buy a book and send it to them. So please do that in the comment section or on Spotify or Apple. Overcast, we have a lot of listeners on Overcast. So if you're listening on Overcast, please do that or send us an email. And Travis, I'm going to take you up on uh, potentially having another conversation one day. But just thank you so much for helping me learn more about this and formulate my thoughts more clearly and sharing all your wisdom and everything else with people. If there's any sort of lasting things you want to say or guiding people to your website and where they can learn more about your work, please. Sure. My website is travisthompsoncounseling.com. I have links to um, any kind of media that I've done or articles, anything like that. Um, This book is super helpful (laughs) for the people that feel like they've been left behind and, I love speaking and speaking in venues, podcasts. I mean, I'm a therapist. I speak all day. So (laughs) um, that's going to be honestly a big part of my career for the rest of my life is advocating and talking about things like this. 
Awesome. Thank you. And, and all the links to your stuff will be in the sort of description and the show notes. So if anybody wants to access it there. And yeah, again, Travis, thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. I am very grateful that you watched to the end of this video. Please click one of the boxes to watch more of our content and otherwise have a great day. Peace out.